You're listening to the Revision Path Podcast, a weekly showcase of the world's black graphic designers, web designers, and web developers. Through in-depth interviews, you'll learn about their work, their goals, and what inspires them as creative individuals. Here's your host, Maurice Cherry. Hello, everybody, and welcome to Revision Path. Thank you so much for tuning in. I'm your host, Maurice Cherry. Revision Path is supported by Brevity & Wit. Brevity & Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They are always looking to expand their roster of freelance design consultants in the U.S., particularly brand strategists, copywriters, graphic designers, and web developers. If you know how to deliver excellent creative work reliably and enjoy the autonomy of a virtual-based freelance life with no non-competes, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit. Creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is supported by the School of Visual Arts, BFA Design, and BFA Advertising programs. SVA values originality and critical thinking while providing students an immersive learning experience with their faculty of industry experts. The BFA Design program empowers students with the tools and opportunities to shape the future of design. And the BFA Advertising Program equips students with the skills in media and new tech needed to excel in the advertising industry. Learn more at sva.edu and enroll today to join one of the most influential artistic communities in the world. Now for this week's interview. I'm talking with Mike Nichols. Mike is a designer, creative director, and storyteller in Oakland, California, and he's the founder of the media platform Umber. Let's start the show. All right, so tell us who you are and what you do. My name is Mike Nichols. I am a creative director, designer, visual artist, and community builder. Mike, how has 2024 been going so far? Actually, it's been pretty good. You know, it's the end of last year was a little tough, but this year is I've definitely seen the light, the light at the end of the tunnel, and it's been good. I can't, I can't complain, man. Honestly, dude, like the opportunities that I'm trying to set myself up for are really starting to show up. I'm getting more like clear around the work I want to do, and really, I think me turning like 48 last year, like mm-hmm. December, um, is like oh. I'm 48 now. I'm like, this is something I forget how old I am. But this year is like, no, no, no. I'm like, you are 48 years old. You're two years away from being 50. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So it just, it just kind of, everything else gets kind of blurred out. Yeah. And just get really kind of focused. Right. And so I feel like I'm becoming more and more like clear around the kind of work I want to do and what, and how I want to see myself in the next like 40 years, you know? So, yeah. No, it's interesting. I think we all kind of have these clarifying years that happen. Mm -hmm. Um, For me, it was last year, too. I was telling this to my mom about how... Are you familiar with The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy? I remember the... There was a... Wasn't there a movie with Most Def in it? Yeah, there was a movie, Most Def and Martin Freeman, yeah. Yeah. It's a book by Douglas Adams, and I read it in high school, and like, there's a Mm -hmm. part... Well, one of the things in the book that's like a an endearing kind of cultural thing is that the answer to everything is 42, And I turned 42 last year Mm -hmm. and last year was like the roughest year that I've had financially, emotionally, career wise, everything. And 42 has been such a clarifying year. I mean, by the time this comes out, I'll be turning 43 in March. But like by the time this comes out, like I sort of was reflecting on that. I was talking to my mom about it. I was like, yeah, 42 was just like this really clarifying year. And she was like, well, yeah, it's kind of the answer to everything. I'm like, yeah, I guess so. But like, I think we end up having these clarifying years that sort of really kind of draw a line in the sand between what's important and what's trivial Mm -hmm. and what you need to focus on. So it sounds like that's what last year was for you, too. Yeah, yeah, it totally was, man. I think it's because right now I'm currently self-employed and I, you know, work with clients and everything and Mm -hmm. and different, you know, it's always from one party to the next. And then I was like, but wait a second, what am I working towards? Yeah. Is everything just a gig? Is everything just, you know, just to pay rent? Like, where am I going with this? Why? Because I feel like sometimes when you work too much, you don't really see the bigger picture. You're just working 
the day in and day out. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I say, like, you, you got to figure out where you're going, dude. Like, you got to really kind of like dial in and kind of get an understanding of your purpose. First, really define your purpose. And one of the things that I did, I was working on this project, almost like a pitch deck of myself to this particular, this agency I, I was going to either work with or try to figure out what it's going to be. Mm-hmm. And in the process, I was trying to figure out like, what is my purpose? And then I became like clear, my purpose is to use storytelling and design to create moments of positive inspiration. Mm-hmm. That's why I'm here. And I'm just looking back on all the stuff that I've done, whatever. I'm always trying to leave some kind of impact of people feeling good about themselves. You know what I'm saying? People feeling like, oh, like a different perspective. I mean, how do you use that? And how do you use design to do that? Right. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So how do you use it as the function of design versus like, okay, this looks great. This is a nice design, but is it moving the needle? You know what I'm saying? Like it, yeah. is people, is there a reaction that happens to it once, once people see it? That's my, why I'm here on this planet and learning that design is not just UX design. It's not just, you know, like social media, like it's way is more, it's, it's beyond that. Right. And you, how do you use it as a, as a tool, you know? And so. So knowing that and sort of now coming into that purpose, like, what do you want to change for this year? For me, as being a part of something that is bigger than me, right? And in a lot of ways, the work that I've done with people, like I said, I feel like I've always kind of been in this, like, for the next project, for the next project, for the next project. I needed to go somewhere now. You know what I'm saying? Like, I needed to actually have a, a destination, but I'll say that with being that as long as I have a vision of where it needs to go, things could change while I'm on that journey for this project, but at least I know I'm going somewhere. And then as the world and universe, things happen around me, I can adjust and learn a new experience or, or learn something new that I haven't learned before, but I just need to have a focus on it. And so what I really want to do is really work with something that work with something that's bigger than me and really through collaboration. I had this ceremony, mushroom ceremony, uh, last mm-hmm. year, no, earlier this year, January, excuse me, January this year, whatever, one thing that come up is that abundance is through collaboration and partnership. That's where the abundance is, not just me just doing everything by myself. What does that look like to put myself in a position to do that? Like beyond me, but for something like bigger than me. And so that's really kind of how I'm trying to see it. Like, all right, I have this talent, I have this ability, I have this experience. Now, how can I put it in a place where it's going to have a bigger impact outside of just pay me money so I can pay rent. I hear that. I hear that. I think that's something a lot of folks have started to really come to terms with now. I don't want to say coming out of the pandemic because we are still very much in it, but I think the past few years have really clarified for a lot of people what their purpose for working is and what does it mean to have success, especially at a time when so many of what we thought at that time were our freedoms were so easily kind of taken away, like the freedom to travel and the freedom to congregate with loved ones and things like that. Like now people are structuring their lives around. It's not necessarily like working to live, but it's living. Well, it's the opposite, not living to work, but but working. So you know what I mean? They're coming now to a a realization that work is not the end all be all, which I think in, in many ways has the corporate world shook and, some of their reactions to it, like, you know, mass layoffs and union busting and stuff has really materialized over the past few years. It's crazy. I mean, it's, it's crazy to, to how do you hold like both things, right? Yes, you need to work to pay your rent. Yes, you need to work to pay your mortgage. You know, you have, you, have, you have family, you have all these things, wherever. And also, too, whatever, like you can still work for a purpose. Yeah. That's bigger than you, right? Those two things can exist. And you can still get paid all the money you deserve that's based upon your experience, your perspective, your talent, and to, you know what I'm saying, work with something that's bigger, you know what I'm saying? And so work is interesting right now, particularly with AI, how AI can kind of like do the work for you, mm-hmm. right? And I think about what does my world look like in that as a designer. And one of the things that for me is that is getting sort of out of the let me just work on this font. Let me just work on this color. Let me just work on this thing. Let me just work on this pitch deck for you. What's the bigger thing we're doing here, guys? You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? Like, let's, let's go. Let me work up there. And then whatever like tools we need 
to what that secure this vision. I want to be up here so we can really shape what it needs to be. It's sort of get out of the out of the minutia of design. But picking a font is important. It is important. Picking the right colors is important. UX is important. All that's yeah. important. But what are we trying to change here? You know what I'm saying? Like, like what's the the bigger what the bigger goal here? You know, so I want to be a part of those conversations. I want to be a part of that space. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, man. Like my approach to design. I graduated '99 with a bachelor's, and larger part, my process is pretty much still the same. I'm still approaching design the way I approached it when I was in college, even when I was in high school to a certain extent. But there's something else that can be done differently and still maintain my process and still maintain my identity and my DNA, right? You yeah. know, so. Well, let's talk about one of, I think, probably the biggest expressions and distillations of that design DNA, which I think mm-hmm. most people probably know you from now that are listening to this podcast, which is Umber. Mm-hmm. Umber started out as a magazine that you had launched in 2017 after a successful Kickstarter campaign. When mm-hmm. did you sort of first have the idea that you wanted to create a magazine? So the idea for Umber came in 06, actually. Um, I was living in Philly at the time. I was going to give you just a little backstory mm-hmm. before I got there. So growing up, I grew up in Charlotte, uh, I'm in North Carolina, Charlotte, and I've always been a hip hop kid. And for me, magazines was the social media back there, right? You know, there was always like Cycle World and highlights for children. I'm a mom would always give me those magazines. <laughs> and then when hip hop came, of course, there was like, there was Word Up, there was Ebony, there was Jet, there was Essence, and mm-hmm. then there was a Source magazine, was a, was a pivotal moment. But design wise, it was vibe that like, oh, what is this? I remember mm. this cover. It was my senior year in high school, it was 93. And on the cover, this was maybe their second or third issue, or could be the first issue. There was Snoop Dogg on the cover, and on the cover said "Bow Wow Wow," right? In a really mm-hmm. big, full font. And I'm like, "What is this?" Because at this point, Vibe Magazine, I didn't know that then, but it was had a more of a European kind of feel to it, right? It didn't look like Essence, or it didn't look like Word Up. There was mm-hmm. the, the art quality of it was different. That really ingrained in me my love for just print media, and as it relates to a culture and hip hop. So fast forward to college, one of my teachers was he had did a feature or, or he did some he gave some artwork to this magazine called Immigrate. So one of our type classes for type design, we have to read this book by Immigrate. So Immigrate started in 1984 by this hus- husband and wife team out of the Bay Area, actually in Berkeley. At the time they were living in Oakland when they started it. Mm-hmm. And they merged so the wife was the font designer and the husband was a graphic designer. So they were marking their fonts in the magazine. So I was like, yo, and I just loved their layout. I loved the, the focus on it, where it wasn't just about text. It was about the whole layout, composition, type, photos, and just a, just an artistic looking magazine. And so then back in 06, I'm like, yo, what if I did a black version of Immigrate? And so then at this point, I was trying to figure out, so what is, so what is the magazine going to be about? And this is before the term of diversity and inclusion and inequity. The word that I looked up was multiculturalism was the word that I found. Mm-hmm. I was like, how do I show my perspective as a black man, but a, with a global view, right? That was the premise of it. What kind of stories are we going to talk about? And I really wanted to kind of focus more so on the design versus a bunch of text you're reading. So it becomes almost like an art book. Right. And so that was the time where I figured out, okay, I want to make this magazine. And then to come up with the name Umber, I was thinking about as an illustrator, I'm using Bert Umber as the, so my drawing style is, is, is focused. I'm a drawer. I'm a drawer more so of a, of a painter. Right. And when I'm drawing this, I'm using this, these, these color pencils, these graphite pencils, and this color pencil was called Umber. I looked it up. Oh man, Umber means brown pigment from the earth. I'm like, Dude, that's that's <laughs> the, that's the name, right? So that's why I came up with the idea for Umber in 06. That was the time I lived in Philly, and then I moved to uh, the Bay Area in 07. So I still was thinking about the idea, thinking about the idea. And then in 2012 is when I made that prototype of Umber. I was like, you know, let me just make the thing, right? Since having the idea for Umber, the landscape of print media was going through all of these different changes, right? You know what I'm saying? And so... 
Because back then, you know, print was still kind of holding strong, but it was losing out with the online content to websites and stuff. Yeah, so it really started in 06 was the idea, trying to merge my love for, for culture through vibe, almost like the mixture of vibe, also immigrant magazine. Like, how do I merge those two, but from my perspective? Mm-hmm. So I made this prototype in 12, and let me just I print like 100 copies. Let me just show the people, right? And then this, this is the time where I got all of these really grounding, humbling reality checks. And I was reaching out to this one woman who was, at the time, she was the, the editor for Huffington Post Black Voices. I don't okay. know how I got her number. I don't know how I got her name or email, but I did. <laughs> I reached out to her. Hey, I'm going to start this magazine. And she was like, okay, well, everyone wants to do a magazine. Why are you important? <laughs> and she mm-hmm. was like, come back to me with your business plan, the business plan, all of these things, whatever. Like, dude, literally, real talk, I cried. I'm like, hold, like she just bust my bubble. I'm thinking, like, I'm going to make this amazing magazine. She's like, well, everyone wants to do one. Like, why are you special? Yeah. And so then I was just, I was just really just heartbroken. Like, oh man, it just made me feel like I all the work and research I did for the past, you know, this is at this point six or seven years of like figuring out to do this forever. It made me realize, it made me feel like I didn't do anything yet. Mm. I didn't even get started yet. And then five years later, you know, in 2016, I had just broke up from this relationship, and I was I did like this little trip out in the in the woods of of the Bay Area, and I was like, you know, it's time, it's time to do armor now. It's time. And so then in first of, of 2017, I got up on my print. Like, hey, y'all want to launch this magazine. So, some of y'all have seen the prototype. Now I really want to make it real. Now I said, well, how am I going to do this? And so I don't want this to be a business, y'all. I just want to just get this thing out. Yeah. And I remember just being in my apartment. I, was, I just had this little, this little apartment and we were all on the floor, about five or six of my friends. And we said, Kickstarter is how to do it. Because I've seen another magazine, funny story. This woman named Danielle Smith from Oakland. Mm-hmm. She, was a, she was the editor for Vibe, and her and her husband, Elliot, Elliot. Wilson. Yeah, yes, launched the magazine, a hardcover magazine called Hardcover. Hardcover. Kick- I have that because they only did like one issue. I think they yeah, only one did issue, one issue yeah. of it. I've got that in my living room. The orange cover of it. I've got that. I have the black cover. So, um, <laughs> so yes, yeah, so I, I was like when I saw there. Can you start a oh, I can do this now. Here's an example. Because she worked at Vibe, because he worked at the source and also Double XL. Like, okay, now I know it, it can be done. So yeah, so I went about working on it. And and then at the time, for me, is about the whole premise of Armor is like highlighting my community, my perspective. So I invited all I want to do an article feature all of my friends who I knew, all of my friends who are I feel like who are dope, who are, are creative, even though it was a design magazine. We didn't feature just designers. We just featured anybody who has a different perspective on life, right? You know what I'm saying? And so, and because the name was called Umber, I only printed it in two colors, black and brown ink the whole time. Mm-hmm. One, to save money for printing. And two, just to kind of like, like as a designer, how much can I flex for just two colors? <laughs> get, some, get some grays, get some tans, get some, get some duotones, uh-huh. all of that with just with two colors. And so like, that was really the, the premise of it and we lost a Kickstarter campaign. I did a video at this at where well, it's not here anymore, but there was this magazine store um called Issues um in Oakland. And I go to all the time spending like fifty dollars a pop every time I go there. I ask them, hey, can I record my my video here for Kickstarter? And, and they said, Yeah. And so and this is why I have a full time job. Um I have this job down in Mountain View. Did I release the campaign? I did the campaign, got the money, got it printed. We can talk about all of that, but then in 2018 and next year, I left my job to focus on my design work, my freelance work, and number. Wow, that's that's quite a story. I mean, I too also kind of grew up with this really big love for magazines. Like I grew up in in like the country, country in Alabama, and all mm-hmm. we had were magazines. Like we didn't have cable, we didn't have yep. a mall, we didn't have a movie theater. We had television and church. And school. And that was it. And so magazines were like my outlet into a greater world. Like I had vibe and source and and all that sort of stuff. Because if we wanted to buy a magazine from somewhere, you either had to have a subscription mail, which is how we got all our magazines. Or we had to drive 50 miles to Montgomery to go to the Montgomery Mall or like to a a Books a Million or a Walden Books or something and get a magazine. Because you just couldn't 
you couldn't get magazines. I definitely empathize with that whole thing of like just growing up and seeing it. Like Vibe for me also was another big Vibe source. Uh, mm-hmm. When I was a kid, I got Zillions, which was like this kid's version of Consumer Reports. Like all of that mm-hmm. kind of like got into me loving magazines, YSB, Emerge, yeah. Yeah. all of that, yeah. all of that oh really kind of completely like changed my world. That's so interesting. You mentioned that about hardcover. Cause like Danielle, I know Elliot still does like rap radar. And so he's still mm-hmm. doing journalism kind of more on a digital scale. And Danielle was doing hardcover. Now she has a magazine, not a magazine, a, uh, a newsletter that she does mm-hmm. called shine bright. Yeah. Like they're yeah. still continuing doing their kind of journalistic efforts just through kind of different means. But yeah, hardcover was great. I really wanted them to continue hardcover. And you could tell they really put a lot of love into that one issue. When Danielle, her book, Shine Bright, came out, I think her her newsletter was was inspired by that or or continuation of that book, whatever. And so she bought a copy of Umber. Oh, wow. Oh my gosh, man. I was like, like, (laughs) girl, you don't know. I, I email her every so often. She'll be gracious enough to like respond to you know like yeah her, you gotta respond wherever but, but like anyway she bought umber one time and she was in oakland and she bought it at this store here in oakland she bought it said, oh my gosh and she said i love umber and she's like oh that's i'm done i am done <laughs> that's all i need danielle smith to know so danielle smith excuse me wilson excuse me smith knows that elliot wilson knows my umber so <laughs> i remember doing the pitch that she trying to get money for i think the for a wealth issue, you know, like now, okay, let me do a pitch deck and try to get some money where I put like readership. Dan, Daniel Smith, mm-hmm. Elliot Wilson. And I mean, so look, I, it's the know, truth. It's the truth. It's the truth, right? Because <laughs> when somebody, one thing I learned is that if you have a copy of Umber, there's a good chance two or three people are going to see it just because you have it, right? Mm-hmm. And so, you know, yeah, I just remember that, whatever. And, you know, so the fact she owns a copy of Umber just means a lot to me. You know what I'm saying? She's definitely been a huge inspiration. But yeah, she's doing it in the way with most of around newsletter. I think she's a, I think she writes for like, I guess, New York or all these different places. But yeah, man, yeah. yeah. Man, shout out to Danielle Smith, man. Lord of mercy. Shout out man. to them, Danielle and Elliot. Shout out to both of them. And, yeah, and, 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 boy, yeah, Elliot. And I just respect his passion around. He did a magazine before the source. It was ego tripping. He, he, it was him, Sasha Jenkins, I believe. Brett so Rollins, like Brent, who, I've, Brent who Rollins. I've had on the show. He was episode 400. Yeah. Oh, and, and I sent him copies of Umber. You know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm making sure <laughs> all my heroes. And one of the things I missed out, though, I feel like I missed, was that time. Like, I never had a copy of Ego Trip. And I feel like that ethos. Like, I guess I would say Wax Poetics is sort of in a similar kind of space, but I missed out on that time because I just didn't know I was too young to know about all these magazines that are out that were, I guess, alternatives to other source. And so when I'm doing Umber, I'm trying to really embody, I would say that it's Umber the design, the approach where was rooted in, in nineties mm-hmm. and then sixties, right? In the seventies in terms of aesthetically wise. So like that's the, the, where I'm, those are the two eras I'm pulling from when I'm designing Umber. And mm-hmm. I tried to design Umber as if I had no computer. Because I remember in, in college, we had this one assignment with the same teacher who, who told me about Immigre. We had to design this whole book with no computer. We had to use a typewriter, mm-hmm. you know, and for photocopier, right? And so I try to approach it that way. So if any, if my computer shuts down, if I, you know, if I don't have access to the internet or no Wi-Fi, I can still design something. And I still feel like, I always tell people this, and definitely young designers, like, the computer cannot solve your design problems. It can't. Mm-hmm. It can make it look pretty. It can give you, it can give it the, <laughs> the shine. That it can give you the ice on the cake, but it can't solve your problems. So the more you can sketch and really just conceptualize what you're looking for, when you touch a computer, it should just be breezy. You should just be coasting at this point. So when I design number, I, I try to design it in that same fashion. Of like, okay, there's no computer. How would this look if, if I didn't have have in design like Cork Express, <laughs> you know, old school? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, if I didn't have these things, how would Umber look? And I try to make sure that it looks like as if I can do it without the computer. And so mm-hmm. it's clear that Oakland is a huge part of just like the DNA of Umber. I mean, one aside from the fact that you're in Oakland and creating it, mm-hmm. but like 
you mentioned earlier, you got a lot of your friends to mm-hmm. kind of be a part of it and everything. How does Oakland influence your work through Umber? Like, what does that mean to you? Oh, man, it's huge. When I first moved to California from Philly, I was in San Jose. A friend of mine with the college with in Chicago is from the South Bay. So the South Bay is like maybe about 45 minutes away from Oakland. Oakland is, is, you know, is is north of it. And I just didn't feel at home in San Jose. And a friend of mine who was visiting from Philly was visiting her friend in Oakland and went to hang out with her. Oh, man, I need to go to Oakland. So literally like in three months, I moved to Oakland. Didn't know anybody, but I felt at home. Mm -hmm. I feel like this is where I need to be. I would just be walking around. And at that time, this is a way. There was this kind of like the surge of kind of, I would say, transplants who were moving to Oakland. Not to the sense of like gentrification, but I feel like there was a lot of just like folks who just showed up there being their authentic selves, whether it's with the passion through art or dance or with activism, social justice. Like that's really the root of Oakland here, you know, with the, with the Black Panthers and all. Mm-hmm. So I just felt at home here. So that this idea I had back in 06, oh, maybe this is a place where I could do it now. And to your point, Umber. We're based in Oakland, but our perspectives is global. Like we interviewed, I've had featured people from from Guadeloupe, from Switzerland, from China, from Sudan, from Peru, all black or brown people from all over the world, right? But it's still rooted in Oakland. And so being here and finding my community in Oakland made Umber possible. If I didn't live here, I don't know if Umber would be what it is today. You know, the thing about Oakland is that People will support you. If you show up and they see you and they see you kind of really making an effort, like do I would go, I would go to, I would bend at festivals. I would just show up. And I think a lot of times when you show up and you're being your authentic self and bringing something to the city, mm-hmm. right? Something you can just move somewhere and then, all right, let me just like take up space and not do anything about it. Let me just do my own thing wherever. But not. if I'm here, I want to collaborate with people who are actually are from here. It's almost like, I got to check in. You always hear rappers, well, you have to check in. If you go someplace, I want to check in to make sure, like, dude, I want to honor, like, thank you for letting me live in this city. Mm-hmm. Thank you for letting me be here. I appreciate you. I appreciate with the city that that you cultivated. And so, and I think when in Oakland, per se, wherever, like, it's just such, it's a mid-sized city, but it's really, like, small. Once you meet one person, you meet five people automatically. That's just how it is in Oakland at the time. Now it's, it's sort of shifted with the pandemic, whatever, but Oakland just really just meant a lot to me, whatever. And I'm like, I want to, the first with three issues of Umber was printed in Oakland. There's a printer, a local printer here that I was using. And so, um, or, or four issues were printed in, in Oakland. So yeah, Oakland just really just, it fed me, dude. You know what I'm saying? And, and I wanted to, to, to feed it back. When you're here, you feel it. You know what I'm saying? Like the people were like, we'll support you. People will show up. You show up because I think there's a way to where everybody sort of always attend the same events. Any kind of event that's rooted in in black or brown folks or social impact or social justice or activism, like you'll see the same people show up. I've been here now for 16 years and it's just been, you know, it's, it's home, man. Oakland is home. It really is. Now, through the years that, that you've done, I'm, I'm curious if there's been like a, a story or piece or an experience that really kind of changed your perspective on just like life, creativity, et cetera. Like what have been the defining moments for you of Umber? One thing that stood out, this was 2019. So this was our sound issue. This was our third issue of Umber. I came with the, so every issue of Umber has a theme, right? The first issue was about vulnerability. And that was just rooted in the fact that we launching this magazine via Kickstarter just the, the aspect of being a creative and an artist is being vulnerable. That's how you really tap into your gift and your talent. The second issue was on relationships. That was sold out um, in 2018. 2019 was just really a hard year. Earlier that year, um, a friend of mine passed away, a really good friend of mine that passed away that year, and that affected me. And, dude, it was hard. Like, I didn't have any... Umber was, for the most part, I paid out of my pocket. Outside of Kickstarter, everything was like hustling and grinding. So anytime I have freelance work, a portion of that money would go into Umber, right? You know, I would get support via like different partnerships here and there, but for the most part, it was just me. And so that year, I didn't really have a lot of money. 
And I wasn't really sure if Lawnmower was going to get printed. And a friend of mine let me borrow some money to get printed. And I just remember like we did this event. So there was a sound issue. I did a cold call where I guess a cold email on LinkedIn. Power of LinkedIn, man, is incredible, dude. So Bandcamp opened up their offices in Oakland in end of 2018. At the time, there were like just satellite offices. So they decided to do it here. I guess there was a good like portion of people who worked at Bandcamp lived in Oakland. We out to this woman in, you know, on LinkedIn. Hey, I got this magazine called Umbird that's coming out. I would love to, you know, see if we can partner together. So she was open to it. We met. At the time, I had a team of about like four people who were helping me out with Umber. And she was like, well, you can have your release party here for free, essentially. You know what I'm saying? So but long as you pay the artist, as long as, as long as the event is free. No, I think we can charge, but we'd have to make sure that we pay the artists who are, who are performing. So do like I, we did this with three things happened that year. First, we had a partnership with SF Design Week where we had the Umber Lounge. At their main, there's this, this pier in San Francisco that, that they had their the design we got. This is the second year we were involved. We had this beautiful Umber Lounge there where people showed up and it was just incredible energy. And then a week later, we had this event at Bandcamp. And dude, I didn't know all these people showed up and I didn't, there were some people who showed up who knew about Umber but didn't know that I did it. Mm. But they knew me. Yeah. Right? I'm like, holy shit, man. Like, People are here. And usually some of the events that I host, I would never go to because I don't like big <laughs> crowd. I don't right. like a lot of that kids like I like to just be a hermit. But it was just an incredible show, man. And the woman who we uh, featured in Umber, her name is Jasmina, she she performed that show. And then my friend Monty Draper, who actually wrote her article, was actually is a is an incredible hip hop artist here in, in Oakland. He performed, and it was just an incredible moment, dude. And and just seeing all those people there, like, okay, I'm something is happening that's bigger than me, you know. What I'm so for people to show up and see me, but didn't realize that I'm the one who's doing Umber, it just meant a lot to me, you know what I'm saying. And so, and this is the hard you where I wasn't sure if I could actually print that issue. So my friend helped me; she supported me. To, she lent me the money to get printed. I finally paid her back. The next year, it, it, during the pandemic, is <laughs> where I finally paid them back. Mm-hmm. But it was just an incredible moment, man. It's like, okay, all right, this is, there's something here. There's a need for this, you know? And so, yeah, man, I feel like that was the moment that made me the, one of the hardest years of my life where I was a, I had to eventually notice this to be real with you. Like, you know, just things were really, really tight that year. Cause once again, I'm freelancing, right? So that point, I was in the studio every day. Every day mm-hmm. when I'm working on Umber or doing my, doing my freelance work. Right. So it was just an incredible year of ups and downs and ebbs and flows, but it came out and then, you know, then the pandemic. happened. <laughs> yeah. The pandemic really, I mean, it really threw a lot of, a lot of people's plans like into jeopardy and, <laughs> and, and limbo really. Cause we didn't know when this would be ending or anything like that. I remember that year, beginning of 2020, we were, we hadn't really announced it yet. We were kind of just soft launching, but we were about to do a national tour for the podcast. And mm. we had did the first stop out in LA with AIGA Los Angeles. We did it in Lamert Park. It, had a, it was a great event. We talked to a uh, a local black architect out there in LA. And I, like we did it, it was February, 2020. And mm. I already had like cities planned that we were going to go to. And I think it was on the way back. No, no, no. When I was there, they were talking about this COVID-19 outbreak at LAX. And I was like, what is that? Let me buy a little mask or something somewhere. And I remember coming back on the plane, people were wearing masks. And, you know, I got back to Atlanta. And I think like two weeks later, once March started, that was the beginning of the pandemic. And then that just dashed everything. Like that just dashed all my plans. So, yeah, I feel you. It was so weird because I... On a personal note, whatever, I made more money that year than I ever mm-hmm. made in 2020. Just because yeah. I mean, you know, people, oh, black designers. That's, 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 oh, that's, don't get me started about that. <laughs> You're talking oh, about like the money. summer that's, of 2020 that's, and and all of that. Yeah. Oh my God. Yeah. It, it was, yeah. It was just it was just a weird thing. I you know, I was still able to release our, our fourth issue, our own sports and athletics. You know what I'm saying? And and even that moment, right? Like 
my goal was to make content that was evergreen, right? Mm-hmm. So if I had this idea of doing like sports and athletics and movement, I'm still going to do that issue. Yeah. Kind of not taking in the fact that I didn't want to make something that was very topical. So as it relates to like the stuff with George Floyd and, and all the pandemic, I didn't want to make a George Floyd issue. I don't want to make a pandemic issue. Mm-hmm. I'm like, here, here's a thing. Here's a perspective. Whoever I interview, I want your perspective, your voice. So whatever you want to talk about within this theme, let's talk about it. And, you know, I've had people, friends of mine who are like, felt some kind of way about, oh, you should do something different. You should, you should mm-hmm. be talking about sports. This is, this is the time to be talking about this. I'm like, what? Everybody's doing that, right? How do, that's not my, my story to tell. My story to, the tell is to, to stay focused on what I want to do, right? Mm-hmm. But still, leave it up to you know whoever. If we interview somebody, they want to they want to talk about it, going to it. Please do that. You know what I'm saying? So it was just hard, dude, to like to feel like you have to respond and you have to like to chime in because everybody else is on the same way. You mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? So 2020 was so it was such an interesting. Like, granted, I told you I'm already a hermit, so in a lot of ways. This is right in my alley. I'm staying, I'm staying home. <laughs> I'm staying right home. The only thing I had was my studio I came to, right? Which was, if I didn't have that, it probably would have been harder. But mm-hmm. so my studio is in West Oakland, but I live by Lake Merritt, which is, is closer up to downtown Oakland. Uh, more is little is east of downtown Oakland. But um, so I would always would come to the studio, you know what I'm saying? It just work. And so, you know, it also was a moment for me to like back to, you know, the point we talked about a while ago is that. Be clear, like, do I need to be at this event? Do I need to do that? Who's really checking for me? Who who should I really check for to make sure they're good? It really makes you really focus on, like, what's really, really important. Mm-hmm. Who is really, really important? What kind of work is really, really important versus just doing something to be doing something, right? And so it was very humbling that time. I mean, for actually, no, two issues I put out that year. You know, I did a little zine highlighting social mischief because I interviewed them at the end of 2019 and then then this year around sports and so later that year and so the thing about Umber too is that and I think any any process wherever it, for me it was healing dude like it was really about healing something I'm I'm going through you know what I'm saying like mm-hmm. for the sound issue I grew up always stuttered right and it, you know it happens it still happens you know not a lot but we have to get nervous or excited but growing up, I couldn't talk at all. Like I had a therapist, had a speech therapist from kindergarten all the way to high school, my senior year. And so when I'm doing these issues, I'm really working on the shit that I'm, I'm trying to work on for myself, whatever, right? And so so it's almost like if somebody's being featured in Umber and they're being vulnerable, like, yo, I'm being vulnerable too, y'all. Like, I'm still, I'm with you on this. In the sports issue, like just being okay with my body, just being okay with, I'm not an athlete. I am athletic-ish. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> I make efforts to do so. So every issue was that. And then in a lot of cases, too, it becomes therapy for people who are who are part of it as well. And so so I needed, during the pandemic, I needed to do Umber. I needed to get it out. Because if I didn't have that, I don't know, where do you put that energy? Where do you put that focus when, when shit all around you is just is nuts and going crazy? I mean, some of the things that you've spoken to, I mean, the pandemic, funding, et cetera, I certainly can empathize with that just doing like a, I mean, doing revision path. And I've talked about it, you know, pretty publicly on the show. Like we've had issues with funding. We've had issues with, you know, things like that. There's a lot of stuff about the show that I haven't talked about just in terms of like, honestly, just in terms of keeping revision path black, Mm -hmm. you would be surprised the amount of people that want me to compromise that singular focus of this entire platform for really nothing. I could understand if it was for a bag and I sold out. Like that's, that's something mm-hmm. that I could be like, well, you know, maybe <laughs> these are just like, you would be surprised the number of people that are like, I want to be the first non-black person to integrate revision oh path. And I'm gosh, like, man. why, what would you get out of that? Out of side of some weird perverse satisfaction. I bring this up because I'm wondering outside of what you mentioned, like, what challenges have you had to face in keeping Umber's authenticity? Yeah, well, I'll say this. When I first started Umber, I never wanted to start with this is a black woman magazine. Mm-hmm. I wanted you to see it and, oh, all the people black and brown here. I had no idea. That was the effect I wanted, Yeah, right? 
then at some point, I was like, you know what? Or somebody would say, Mike, you got to really let people, to your point, people would say, hey, I want to be a part number. Well, you, you know, you ain't, you ain't black, you ain't, you know, you're white. Yeah. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, so it's, it's a way for me, like, let me just be clear what this is. So, you know, so you don't get excited to want to be a part of it. Right. Because I feel like in the Bay Area, folks, everybody want to be there. <laughs> everybody, want to be there. Mm-hmm. everybody wants to be a part of the thing. Right. So I think the challenge for me was that having to really just like, let me just say what it is. So you get it. But my idea is that even when I'm, when I feature people in Umber is like, you don't have to start with as a black person, X, Y, and Z. You're already with us. Just talk about what you're passionate in. Your identity, your perspective will will come through in your vernacular, the words you use, your mm-hmm. perspective. But you don't need to say as a black woman, or you don't need to say like as someone who is who is Native American. Like just talk about what you're passionate in, because you're with. It's almost like if you're with your people, if you're at home with your mom or with your family, whatever. Like you don't have to say as a black. You are it, so you don't need to overstate it. So my goal was to really make a magazine make a space where people could feel comfortable being vulnerable and being who they are without having to kind of give a, like a preface add such and such, just be you. Right. And so that was a challenge of like, really just having to, having to cave into the algorithm, giving people what they want to hear. So they just, it gets highlighted. I think another challenge of the two ever was that aspect that was printed. And speaking of funding, like the most expensive part of Oma was the printing. Mm-hmm. That's where all the money went. <laughs> no, I believe it. Me. I believe it. I work with writers and, you know, I, I pay as much as I can for writers. And most, I do a lot of the work myself because just to keep costs down. Mm-hmm. But people ask, what's, your, what's the budget, Mike? There, there is no budgets. Out there. <laughs> <laughs> I can make up something. The budget didn't really get more, I would say maybe the fourth issue is when I start to really identify what the budget is or just try to like be more intentional around, okay, all right, this is the limit I've set to spend. I don't want to spend no more than this. Mm-hmm. Right. And so, but the printing, it became the thing that I felt made Umber the most unique, whatever it is the thing that actually was also in a way kind of holding me back in mm-hmm. a way of like more exposure. Or, Cause I always wanted people, Oh, you're going to have, you can put some online. You should go online. You should be on social media more like all of this stuff. You, I should be doing, you should be doing this. You should be doing this. People should see it. People should hear it. People should read it. And I'm like, but I want to stay true to the the premise of this is I'm doing a black and brown print magazine in Silicon Valley. Mm-hmm. In the home of Pandora, in the home of Adobe, in the home of Google and Facebook and Empire, like all of these really rooted tech companies here in the Bay Area. And here I am coming out with a niche on top of a niche on top of a niche magazine in a way for it to kind of cut through, right? How do you cut through? You know, it's all of the stuff that everybody's doing. And so I think the most, the part of the most challenging part of it was the fact that it was print. People love the print, right? It's a beautiful, I make sure I pick the right paper, the quality mm-hmm. of it, the, with the, the glue, the ink, the press checking, like everything is like top notch, like the, in terms of the craftsmanship of it. And it was expensive. And it was, you know, to the point to where because of this print, there's certain things I couldn't do, something I couldn't afford. But with that being said, though, it was my art practice, dude. It was my time to like, let me show you how I really design. Because mm-hmm. a lot of times, if you're working with design or work with clients, somebody wants to work with you. Oh, are you a designer? Oh, I need this logo done. But do you, have you seen my work? Do you know my style? <laughs> do you know? Yeah. I'm the, I'd rather you pick me because, Mike, I love your aesthetic. I love how you approach it. Can we take some of these these same elements and do it for me, right? Or or apply like if you could do this, I know you could do anything. So for me, I'm like, I need to show y'all what I can do as a designer. Yeah, I need to show you what I can do as an illustrator because after I went to school of illustration first, I went back to school for design because you know it just paid more. There's more opportunities as as a designer. So I need to show y'all that I can draw. For the longest time, dude, people didn't realize actually I was designing the magazine. Mm. They just thought I was just putting it together. I said, no, 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 I did all the drawings, all the layout. But once again, it was just my art practice to really just like hone into like, okay, let me really go, let me really take it there as an artist and as a, yeah. and as a designer. Because nobody else is going to give me the opportunity to, to flex like this. So I need to do it so I could show you. So that's really what that was. Like, let me, part yeah, money-wise, but really is like, 
yo, I'm good at this. I've been doing this for a long time. Like, I really want to see how much I could do with just two colors, right, in print. Yeah, it was more practice, man. That's really what it was. And then eventually I became, you know, not, this was not intentional, but Umber became my portfolio. I wasn't thinking about it in that way, but then I would get projects to, for people to want to work with me because of what I did with Umber. And that way I got paid from it. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. that way. Mm-hmm. I'm a marketing tool, but yeah, I just wanted to really just, just flex as, as a creative and, you know, as an artist. Now you've mentioned about, you know, the perils of, of print and like print's expensive. And I get mm-hmm. it. Like I, I, I put together a print magazine for one of the companies I used to work for back in 2022. And yeah, print is expensive. And we did just mm-hmm. like a small, like digest size, not even like something that was newsstand, like full size. So I know it can be really expensive, but it is a lot to like pick out the right paper and the treatments, Mm -hmm. especially if you start looking at, you know, foils and all this kind of stuff. Like, and also let's be real about this during a time when there's a global paper shortage, (laughs) because guess what paper's going into? It's going into the masks because of the pandemic. So like starting all of that through such a, a time where there were all these sort of barriers. I mean, my hat completely goes off to you. And I mean, I've told you this, you know, before, but like, a lot of what you've done and are are continuing, I think, to do with Umber now that you've kind of continued it on is, is really what's needed right now. Like that, that level of community that you've been able to focus through Umber is what's really needed. And I see that you've got something that's actually coming up pretty soon, like in April with Umber. Can you talk about that? Yeah. So it's a collaboration actually with where are the black designers? So they do, you know, they do these meetups, all over the world, like in London. I think they went, actually, I went in Atlanta, I believe, in Atlanta, mm-hmm. LA, I think in New York as well. And so, so I, wanted, I actually wanted to do one here. And so it's really, it's a collaboration between Umber and, and Where Are the Black Designers and really just trying to gather all of the designers in the Bay Area and Oakland, like, let's, let's chat and let's talk. Living here, there's a way to where when, when people are talking about design, it's really segmented and it's really focused on product design. Mm-hmm. But I've been in other groups in the Bay Area where it was black and brown focus, whatever, but everybody's talking about product design. Like, I'm, no, I'm not a UX designer. I'm not a UI designer. I don't, I'm not a product designer. I'm a designer. I'm an illustrator. And mm-hmm. so I really want to have this conversation with an with architect, with uh, actually this woman works on Netflix. She's like a, a systems designer, mm-hmm. right? Then a fashion designer and then me, right? So the premise is a product designer architect and a graphic designer walks into a bar what happens what's the conversation right and mm-hmm. it's going back to the process like what is the process that every designer has no matter what discipline so i have this theory is that what separates a designers is the final result but i really really think our process are probably the same it's just the medium we choose to express that solution whether it's architect whether it's fashion, whether it's brand design, whether it's, it's system design, we still have to be creative, explore, be curious, prototype. That doesn't change. But what we do at the, the last in the final piece or the, the execution of the final thing, whatever, that's where it's different. So that's really my theory and why I'm looking to Umber outside of print. is like print is just a medium. Like I said, it was just my art practice. Mm-hmm. What other things can Umber do outside of that? And so last year, I did a talk show, hip hop talk show for the hip hop of uh, 50th anniversary, mm-hmm. and still rooted in the same kind of premise of a personal journey. And so created this website called a life in hip hop.com. And really just, you know, it's very personal led around like, you know, first I was trying to figure out what are my top 50 MCs, top 50 songs, top 50 uh, moments of hip hop. And then really try to make that succinct and c- concise through an interview with one of my top 50 rappers. And so how do I take this idea of Umber, building a community, having this engagement, you know, with people, having conversation and dialogue, but outside of print? Because one of the things I've learned about when doing Umber in these past six years is that outside of print, it's the, the dialogue that is developing and created amongst our community. Mm-hmm. People seeing each other and engaging and talking and laughing, sharing stories, sharing perspectives. That's really what Umber is. 
the medium was print, just to start a conversation. It's a starting point for bigger conversation. What I realized, was, oh, let me see what other what other things I could do with Umber that's not so, not say I'm going to avoid, who knows, I may do print somewhere down the line again, almost like hardcover, kind of do like a one-off hardcover issue of Umber. But really, how do I take the same energy and ethos of Umber and really focus on engagement with people and really, you know, have these conversations that are centered around design and being creative. And so this partnership with the world of Black designers is that's what's happening in, in, in um, April 6th. And so okay. I'm, I'm excited. Man. So I'm, I'm a fan of Mitzi and what they're doing there. Once again, there's a way to where how do we do this work where we can actually now we or we can kind of share the weight like we can share the the resources and share the perspective versus us having to do it all by ourselves. No, it's sort so, of yeah. like you said before earlier in the, in the conversation, you said abundance is through partnership and collaboration, which is a hundred percent true. Yes. yes. Yeah. So that's how I'm trying to feel like what is Umber like 3.0, right? Or 2.0. I don't know. I'm really, you know, really kind of think about media too, like as a, as sort of a media outlet, this is still early. I don't know what it's going to be yet. So this is this year. It was my year of like to do nothing, <laughs> you know, what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> if I do anything, collaborate with somebody else. But me just doing it all myself, wherever this is like, I mean, I'm sure you can feel this as well with your podcast. Is that do it? Just I just keep going, I just keep going, mm-hmm. I just keep going. Like, when do you actually stop? Right? Let me just stop, let me let the dust settle, let me catch my breath, let me see how the landscape is changing, let me see, let me kind of read the room. Let me kind of feel the energy, feel the ebbs and the flows of what's happening, what's going on. Yeah. And like I said in the earlier, I just I have this theme. I want to do this theme regardless of what's happening. But now this could be a time to listen. Let me see what's, let me be a part of the bigger conversation mm-hmm. versus me just kind of being on my own shit. So that's really where the space I'm in now. You know what I'm saying? Like, let me just slow down. Let me just look at the world. Let me just kind of take it in and see what that next phase will be. That's really where where it is, man. Like, let me just take a moment and reflect and, and recharge and see what else is available. I hear you. I mean, look, I'm about at that point right now in a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> in a couple of weeks, this show will be a wrap and then I can have that moment of reflection also. So I feel you. So let's kind of switch gears here a little bit and learn more about you. You've talked about Growing up in North Carolina, you've talked about different places that you've lived, like, and you also mentioned going to college at the art institutes, you know, kind of studying visual communications and stuff back in the 90s. Like, I'm curious, it sounds like you really kind of had this love and interest in design and art from like an early age. Yeah, I have, man. So my dad is also a visual artist and designer. He went to school in Pratt in the the mid 70s in New York. That's where he actually met my mom. Mm-hmm. And they got married, had me in Brooklyn. And then when I was two, we moved to Charlotte. So my mom is from South Carolina, Summerton, South Carolina, which is a really small town in South Carolina in the middle of the state. Mm-hmm. And she moved to Charlotte to be closer to her mom. And Charlotte at the time was, it wasn't, you know, we didn't have the Hornets at the time and any, you know, sports thing, but it was still like a decent sized city. So we moved there and uh, maybe after about a year or two, they divorced, but I just remember seeing my dad painting. I remember he had this this room where he would just paint. And I still have some of the paintings that he painted at that, that moment. I still have it in my house now. So I've always seen that, right? And every time I remember, I always was was a drawer. I've always drawn. Where I'm drawing comic books, and I was in the hip hop. So I would. So Charlotte is the South, right? So, so there's no trains. There's no like buildings to do graffiti. At least I didn't see. So I would all I would do my graffiti. On paper, and because mm-hmm. I have family from the from New York, I would kind of know what's what's happening. And um, in Summerton, South Carolina, the cousins have always come down for the summer, right? And I remember my cousin Michael, older cousin, he lived in Summerton, but dude, he was a b boy, right? He had the shell toes, he had the the Lee jeans, he had the boom box, but he would draw graffiti and and pickup trucks. So I just would always be inspired by him. So I would always draw graffiti. I was in the comic books. I would redraw like the Peanuts and, and Calvin and Hobbes. And I was in the motorcycles. I would read, read motorcycle magazines. I would redraw my motorcycles. 
I would design sneakers when I was a kid. Like I was like maybe about 10, I would like redesign every sneaker brand, like Etonics, Hill Brook, <laughs> all these kind of random sneakers, Reebok, of course, and Nike and Puma and everything else. And so, so I've always had that. And then in high school, I just remember this representative from the art Institute of Atlanta coming to our, to the art class. And he said, graphic arts. I'm like, oh, what's that? That's not like something I've been doing my whole life. And um, then in shop class, I remember making this business card my senior year. And this is when the guy said, there's this new thing called electronic mail. <laughs> this is 94. <laughs> yeah. So you were talking about it then. And I remember I designed this, this business card says, graphic artist illustrator. This is just type when a typewriter, we type it and we, we get it printed like in the, in, the, in the shop class. I knew early on that I, that's what I wanted to be, right? So then I went to school to our institute. But this is 94. This is the shift when things are moving to the computer. My classes were, were split because I was with school of illustration first. It was split between doing drawing classes, live drawing classes, and, and painting and drawing and, and charcoal to design. And with our institute, they were really focused on, or I would say, industry. So mm-hmm. I've been using Photoshop since, 90, since 95. The wow. first year was all was all drawing. The second year was all Photoshop. Photoshop was the first software I used. Photoshop and Corel Draw. And this is when I believe Photoshop was on a PC. Illustrator was on the Mac. Illustrator was the next year, right? So I've been using Illustrator since 96, 97. I'm still using that same software now, right? Mm-hmm. And so, so yes, yeah, so that, that was the shift. I remember, you know, I remember appreciating there's this thing called Ruby Lift where designers would use back in the days, like before printer mm-hmm. computers, where you know you have to cut the Ruby Lift. It's like this red kind of film to cut like the the trappings and, and clipping, whatever. So like I had one class in it just to say, okay, this is what we used to do. So you know it. Okay, now let's go to computer. <laughs> you know, so let's just kind of jump to the other thing, whatever. And so they're living in LA at the time. This is during the time of Freak Me. Um, during the time where all the, the rappers from the East Coast were moving down there, like I think like Two Show was living there and Eric Sermon from EPMD. So you get this influx of like just it was a party town. I'm not a party kid. I love hip hop. I love dancing, but I don't like the party. I just want to dance and go home. Yeah. And so just navigating that was what challenge. So I would go to all these hip hop shows and see I saw Biggie and Tupac. Where I saw Usher when he was a kid living down there. And so then how do I sort of show up in this city that's really a party town? So Freedney Cap is in 97. At this point, I knew I was moving to Chicago to because it was hard getting a job in Atlanta at the time as an illustrator. Either you worked freelance or you worked at newspapers or, or publishing houses. Mm-hmm. And those, those people weren't giving up the job. These are old white men who have been working for like, like 30-something years. They're not giving up that job, right? So it's hard to do that. So I was like, okay, I need to go back to school for graphic design. So at this point, our institutes had a had a location in, in Chicago called the Illinois Institute of Art because there's an art institute already up there, but that's that's like like a museum. So then I knew I was moved to Chicago in '97. '97, my last year in Atlanta, I designed Freak Me T-shirts. <laughs> so I used Illustrator. Wow. <laughs> this time, this, I didn't have a computer at the time. I had it was Kinkos, right? So I would go to Kinkos to use Illustrator. I would go home. I would draw, I would design it at home on tissue paper, what I want to see. So I redrew Freak Me to look like the letters of Kool-Aid, right? So with Wait the, a I minute, have, you designed those? Yes. Wait, you see it? I've seen those shirts. Oh my God. I see, I mean like, okay, so like, I mean, I grew up in Alabama. I mean, it was just like the state over, but like we would always hear and see about stuff from from freak dick and i had older cousins that would come and visit and stuff and we would go to atlanta every year not for freak nick we would go to atlanta for <laughs> for like six flags and stuff so it was something that i've seen that before i didn't know that you did that wow um, yeah so i did so that was the i did I, so i did that and it was me my friend joe who i'm who he's the homie I, i'm still friends with him he's in atlanta still and my roommate shane we just went around all around Atlantis, I was selling my t-shirts, right? We, we sold them all out, right? So this is my first time really incorporating my drawing background and design. But I had 
an entrepreneur. So like, I'm not a part of person. Free niche really isn't my scene. So let me show up in the most authentic way I know how. Let me show up as an entrepreneur and, and as a, a designer. So this is my way to participate without me having to do all of the other stuff that, <laughs> that goes on to free me. Yeah, so that was my last year there. And then 97, I, mo- I moved to Chicago to study visual communications. Wow. But um, yeah, man. So yeah, so, free- so Atlanta definitely... For me, being a, a fan of hip hop and living in Charlotte, there's no hip hop shows. And at the time, Source Magazine was how I do around. That's how I learned about hip hop. And of course, like videos, there was Beyond TV Raps and Rap yeah. City, of course, at BET. But this was my first time really getting to embrace hip hop in a way. Oh, I can see the people I read about, or I can see the people. I remember seeing Nas perform mm-hmm. when his album just dropped, you know, Maddox. So all of the people, you know, a tribe called Quest, all of this stuff, I, digital planets, all of this was happening in Atlanta. Mm-hmm. So there's a way to where there's a way to where hip hop and design for me is integrated because growing up I would have all the cassette tapes. I would look at the lo- I'll read the liner notes because back then they had the lyrics and the liner notes. Yeah. Right. So mm-hmm. in order to learn the music, you have to read the liner notes. And then with the Admar work and everything. And so that was, you know, my mom had a record, so that's so there's a way to where hip hop hip hop became the tool for me to express my love for design, whether it's graffiti, whether it's through music, whether it's through dance, whether it's through DJ, like all all of these things where we're, oh, excuse me, rap, all of these things influenced my love to be creative. It became like my like three line really of everything I do as as an artist. You know what I'm saying? And so Atlanta was pivotal, man. Atlanta was pivotal. Wow. I had Crazy. no idea that you had did those shirts. I've seen those shirts so many times before. Oh my gosh, man! Yeah, I, I, so we saw. You know, a lot of times like people will kind of reprint it, like without you knowing about it. And so I just remember the last. It was P my part. Me and my mm-hmm. friends we were just walking around, and we saw this guy having wearing our t shirt. I'm like, <gasps> who sold it to him? I don't know. You did? I don't know, but he mm-hmm. has it all. Like, best moment ever. Dude. I mean, we almost <laughs> got arrested. You know, we had the AUC. We almost got arrested out over there. We almost wow. got arrested at the underground. We were on the highway. We were on the, the traffic was so crazy. We were on 95 selling these t shirts, right? Mm-hmm. And you know how traffic is, right? It's backed up and it's not. At one point, no cars are on the highway and we're stuck on the highway. The cop said, You got five minutes to get to your car. <laughs> five <laughs> seconds to get to your car. So we're running. I had an old like Mazda hatchback and we get in the car. We like, we, you know, we drove off, whatever, but uh, Atlanta was pivotal, man, like for my love for hip hop and really learning about being an entrepreneur and just merging design, you know, excuse me, merging design and drawing, in, you know, in one sort of, one sort of like focal point. Now, when you graduated from Art Institute, did you kind of end up going to work right away as a designer? Like, as you're sort of talking about the design industry back then, of course, it wasn't as technological as it is now technology was just starting to really be integrated into what could be someone's you know design process but what were those early days like after you graduated in Atlanta no because I moved to Chicago in Chicago yes so I worked at Kinko's uh-huh. part-time while at the time I was in school which is the best thing ever because I can always get my stuff printed without worrying about the back in the days where you had like the I don't know what to call it the place where you you print out your stuff yeah, like and the print shop. Back, like a yeah, print shop, but in the in the school. Oh yeah, and, I know but, what you mean. I forgot what they, there's a name for them. They called it right. And so anyway, working in Kinko's, I print out everything myself. So at this one, this one moment, this at this one point, I'm buying this this design for this woman. I was like, oh, this is cool. What is this? She said, oh, I made that. I'm like, you made it? Yeah, I have a I have a design studio. I like you do. I said, I'm in school for design. So I became an intern. This place on in Chicago off of Wabash, and so um, so I interned there, and she was intense. She, this woman, owned her own agency. It's like maybe like eight people there, and she was aggressive, dude. Like she would have these girls in there crying, crying. <laughs> you're right, and she was just super aggressive. I think she had to. She probably felt like she had to be the man. You know, she had to kind of over oversell it. Mm-hmm. Anyways, I remember the first time I was working on this design for some trumpet. Thing. I did this beautiful trumpet drawing and illustrating. She was like, what the fuck is that shit? The trash <laughs> and start back over. I'm like, what? And then, 
Dude, literally, she came like, you know what you did was okay, but I know the client, that's what the client wanted. Why didn't you say that the first time? Why do you tell me that versus making me feel all bad and shit? You know, anyway, so long story short, I graduated and I started working there full time. And so I was fortunate to have that experience, to have it to where in she, one of the clients we had was Allstate. So that the hand logo was done there. And we had to work with this illustrator um, to, to do it. So Allstate was one of our big clients. Mm-hmm. Wrigley, because they're I think they're, they're based in Chicago. House of Blues was one of our clients. We did something like Warner Brothers, like Warner Brothers, like like Bugs Bunny, because she one of the, the projects we did a lot was, I guess, licensing projects where where you know these companies that make like notebooks and lunch boxes, they will license these characters from Disney or from Warner Brothers. So I would work on stuff for like with Scooby Doo and Daffy Duck and mm-hmm. Harry Potter. This is this is when I left the job. So we have to work on the, on this presentation for Harry Potter. And this is before the movies came out. This is just when the books were there. So I have to read the book. And so we worked on this huge presentation to present to, I don't think it was with J.K. Rawlings, whoever owned, you know, whoever had the license to use, you know, Harry Potter. So we have to make like mm-hmm. erasers and notebooks and pencils and, and folders, all these things, whatever. So we work on this project, right? Once again, she cuts people out there. That's what she does. And there's one point where we have a morning meeting and then me and Donna, I won't say her last name, me and Donna go <laughs> into, the, into the kitchen to talk about the project. She, so she's looking at the presentation because this is like, we, you know, we're trying to land this project. She was like, you fucked up. Like, no, Donna, you fucked up. I'm <laughs> green, dude. I don't cuss. My mom's a church going woman. When I, when I started cussing, the whole place got quiet. They're like, Mike just, said, <laughs> Mike just cussed her out. Can you believe that? <laughs> and she was like, Mike, go outside, get some air. I said, okay, I will. That's when I had to leave. I was like, okay, all right, it's, I don't need to be working there. Mm-hmm. Mind you, I don't have another job lined up. I said, I don't need to be working there. So I think like a couple of weeks later, I was like, hey, you know, Don, I think it's part time for me to, you know, leave and focus on my art. I came up with this lame excuse, dude. I had no job. I had no opportunities. I had no money. <laughs> and I was living, I had my own apartment at the time in, in South South Chicago in Hyde Park, um, off of Drexel. And, um, mm-hmm. And she was like, well, I don't know what you want to do, but at least work here part-time so you can pay rent. Like, okay, thank you. <laughs> so I started working there part-time to pay rent. And mind you, so when I'm living in South, you know, excuse me, South, South Chicago, there's, I used to take the bus, you know, to go to work. This woman I would see wherever. I just, older woman, just this beautiful black woman. I had a, a huge crush on her, right? So I knew she'd out of my league. She probably got a husband or kids, whatever. So I'm, you know, just talking with her and stuff, whatever. And so... And she said, oh, I work at Playboy. Like, you work at Playboy? She said, yeah, I'm a writer. I'm like, oh, I, you know, I, I draw. So, dude, I get a chance to go into the, the offices of Playboy. And I'm a pretty good drawer of people, but I don't draw naked women. I just, you know, I've drawn women before, but never, like, what they were kind of doing. Right. And so then, so I went up in the, in the office whenever she introduced me to the people. And, you know, of course, they wanted to see the drawings they did of women. Said, oh, well, you know, can we give you, like, a little assignment? So this is, now, this was not, I play both for the magazine. This is for their website. So I drew this small image of this guy like sleeping on on the desk for the article talking about losing sleep, or whatever. Mm-hmm. So so I do. I'm in the office of Playboy, and it was incredible. So like so did once again. That's where the whole thing around print and magazines start to like you know even there when I lived in Chicago, I designed magazines for so many people. There's this group in South South Chicago. They're trying to organize like black men around people who are incarcerated, trying to give them another option. So they're like in the kind of just like what like spiritual Afrocentric kind of vibe. So I designed this magazine called The Village for them. Yeah, I did this other magazine for like this the hip hop collective. So I'm already so once again, I'm still I'm in this so early on, I'm still kind of doing these little side projects for magazines, but they don't but they don't go anywhere, right? Because they don't really have the money to print it. They just have this idea. Oh, we're going to print these things down. And so because I work at Kinko's, I'll hook them up with printing. And, uh, <laughs> anyway, man. So that's really my kind of journey in terms of working. I worked at, at, at that agency for a while until I couldn't work anymore. Started freelancing. Was barely able to pay rent. And then I moved to Philly just on a whim. Some friends of mine were going to move there. And um, they ended up not moving. It was just me. So then I'm now living in Philly, working at Kinko's because I worked at Kinko's in Chicago. In, in Atlanta, I worked at Kinko's. 
a little bit in Charlotte, my hometown, then in Chicago, and then in Philly, you know? And so, um, so Kinko's has been the, the lifesaver dude for every, all these cities I've just randomly moved to. But yeah, so then I'm in, I'm in Philly now, you know? And so still doing freelance work. I ended up working at this bank doing designing <laughs> templates for, for credit card brochures and stuff like that mm-hmm. um, in Delaware, with a Wilmington, Delaware. So yeah, so I kind of was doing that, bouncing around, working at print shops. And never really a job. I'll say this, whatever. I, sometimes I feel like I miss that moment of working in these design environments uh-huh. at that age, in my early, early 20s. Outside that, that job I had in Chicago, Everything else is just like I'm hustling, doing little slide things here and there, working at print shops, working at Kinko's, working at, you know, these kind of random things, working at, you know, I was a with a staffing agency. They would staff me all these different places. And then I worked at this one place. It's like an agency, but they do a lot, a lot of stuff for like like direct mail stuff, like in, in the suburbs of Philly. Mm-hmm. But I feel like I, there's a part where I feel like I missed that moment of working at an agency during those time I was in Philly for those seven years. I don't know, because I, I, I hear no regrets. I'm not having regrets for it, but I know that there's a way to where I've done so much. At the same time, I feel like I took the back roads in design. Mm-hmm. I didn't go to these hush design firms. I didn't work here. I never worked with Adobe. Never worked. I, I just went in this route that probably speaks like truer to my personality of who I am, mm-hmm. but wasn't sexy at all. It was work. It was I feel like these places were like UPS, these places I worked at. I actually worked at UPS in Atlanta. But yeah, man, I just feel like my journey as a, as a designer is just such not, you know, something that you hear people like celebrate or talk about. People are more sometimes excited about, oh, you worked at this firm. Oh, you worked at there. You worked in you know, like something like, what car do you drive? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what car do you drive? That's what it feels like sometimes, right? And so... Umber was a way for me to like build my own luxury car, build this luxury prototype. It's a gas guzzler, <laughs> but it works and it looks cool. Yeah, I think it's just an interesting story around when I see people talk about design and their journey and, you know, when they work at all these very well known places where you rarely hear stories of people working at these little random things. But all of that defined me as a designer, as an artist. My last year in Philly, before I moved out to California, I was doing a lot of like freelance work. There's one organization in West Oak Lane area of Philly where um, I would do a lot of, I would design their their billboards, their marketing, their program design for this festival they did called the, for the Jazz Art Festival, mm-hmm. which is incredible, right? So this, that kind of work, to find the work that I end up doing here in Oakland, right? A lot of my freelance work of the client work is based around people who are either nonprofits, their foundations, social impact groups. That really is the, the bulk of the work that I've done, right? So even though I may not have work in these sexy places, I work, in these, I work with these organizations and these companies that is really rooted in actually my identity as a, as a black man. You know what I'm saying? Like yeah. it's more that space. So, so I'm thankful for that. I don't know. Like if, if I was working at my last job where I worked at before I left, started doing Umber for 10 years, that job came in when I moved to California. I was working with this staffing agency to look for work to offset the work I was doing. Because then when I moved to California, I still had some clients from the, from the East Coast, but they said, well, you're in California now. We should work with people who are local. So, oh, shit. Hey, okay. All right. Well, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Then 08 happened, you know what I'm saying, with the recession, whatever, with the recession and whatnot, and the, with the housing market crashed and whatnot. And so then I began a job. And so the job I was at for 10 years was a staffing industry analyst. And honestly, I went, started as a, as a freelancer. Now I started there from working full time. You know, I was there for 10 years. That's where I grew as a designer, to be honest with you, kind of focused. And at the time, they had a magazine that they were publishing because they started out doing, they would do these kind of newspaper or they would do these kind of newsletters around staffing industry, meaning that a company like HP, a third of their workers are freelancers or, or, or contractors, right? How do you manage 5,000 more freelance, right? So we put our research around that and 
put out research on people who, who place people like Monster and Robert Half um, and Aquin. So they published this magazine um, for the executives of the staffing industry and um, staffing industry report. And at the time, it was produced in this place in the East Coast. I was like, well, you know, I, you know, I can do this. They were like, well, we don't know. I was like, well, not. I can do this. So I talked to my manager and I convinced her, like, I need to, come on, let's go. So then I was able to bring it in house. So now I'm actually designing, you know what I'm saying? It's a B2B, but still it's a magazine mm-hmm. where you learn the front of the book, the feature well, the, the back of the book. And it was printed on web press. So it was like web press is like most magazines that are high production. It was printed on that versus Umber was very offset printing where sheet fed. Web feed is like this big old roll of paper, mm-hmm. you know? So same with the newspapers. So anyway, so do, I did that for like seven years. So I've been there for 10 years because I was able to kind of do things, kind of kind of catch up with the thing I missed in those nine years of seven years living in Philly. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So um, it's in-house. It was a great experience. I mean, the, the work didn't reflect my value or didn't reflect my worldview, but it was work, man. And I was proud of the work I did there. I did a lot there. And now, along with, you know, being an art director, being a designer and everything, you're also a hip hop artist. <laughs> I want to hear I want to hear about East Crest. Tell me about that. Yeah. So East Crest is is a street I grew up on in Charlotte. It was the first street that we moved to where we moved from New York. When I lived in Atlanta, I had a roommate who was a hip hop, who was a producer. He did more R&B stuff. And. And I was really at this point, this is, I'm like, this is like 20 years old, I think. And I want to do this. There's a, there's a point to where when you're passionate about something, you want to be a part of it. You want to join the club. You want to join the party. You want to participate in something that you're passionate in. So I want to start making beats. So then I bought this little drum machine. It was a, it was, it was a Dr. Boss drum machine. No sampling, just like just drum patterns, right? So then he was like, well, if you want to produce, you should get this equipment, which was, a, was an EPS in Sonic. So I got this sampling like keyboard. So this is 97, living in Chicago, in Atlanta. I got my own place after my roommate moved out. Shane, the same guy who went with me to <laughs> sell the t-shirts for uh, free me. So I started making beats in 97. And I wanted to like be a part of hip hop, not just a fan. I wanted to be a part of it. And so I started, I've been making beats since 97 as a hobby. Over the years, I bought that same equipment with me to Chicago, had it there, Philly, still making beats. And then I was dating this girl at the time, and she was like, you should be focusing, go, for focusing on your design, not making this music that you're making the money off of. Like, you know, she didn't tell me to throw it away, but I just felt this grunt like, okay, fine. I, I got rid of all my equipment. And then when I moved to California, my friend who was out, who I met in Chicago, he's a hip-hop producer. And all those friends in, in San Jose are making beats. I'm like, okay, I need to get back into it. So then I tell my mom to ship all my records back. <laughs> that was in her house, mm-hmm. my record player, and I bought the sampler, when the one I'm using right now. And so, you know, who's you know, I've been doing that. We started making beats again since I moved to the Bay Area in, in 07. I was like, you know, I'm I'm been making once again. It became I would say in the last four years, definitely during the pandemic, it became my therapy. It became my my healing. It became my meditation. And the way, I'm the, the way I make beats is very rooted in a very, I would say, 2000s approach. So there's no no computer. Everything is sequenced on this machine. It's like a drum pad. It's like a drum machine with, where you sample and you load up the sounds on each of these pads. And so I'm making it that way. And I remember during the George Floyd stuff that was going on in 2020, I made this beat called Ray, no, Black Rage in the Apocalypse. So this is my first time making the beat to kind of go with my feeling when I'm going through. Not just like, oh, this is cool. I'm one yeah. to express what's going on right now. So then I just started to slowly keep making beats for everybody. Like, you know what? I'm tired of just selling these beats. I've been doing it now since, you know, since I was like, since I was 20. And was me to actually release something. And so I originally released some music under, under Hovercraft. Because I thought oh, Hovercraft was cool. But it doesn't mean anything. East Crest does, right? Mm-hmm. You know, East Crest is where I'm from. I'm from the East Coast. There's a my style of beach is very kind of East Coast based, with very kind of boom bappy. Then I was like, well, I want to really make this real. And so then in uh, November, 
Uh, once again, I've been sending all these beats I've had for a long time. I got my friend who I knew from Chicago to master it for me, make it sound good, and I released it. I haven't been drawing as much lately, but I've been making a lot of beats, though. And so the beats became my way to draw and to be creative and to really express myself and just release and not have it be anything, not have it meet, not have it be consumed in a way it's like it has to mean something for somebody. It's just for me to release it. And so, yeah, man. So East Crest is, you know, is, an, is somebody new. I'm, just, I'm getting to learn. I'm getting to learn about him and know him. Mm-hmm. It's something where I think, you know, it's important just to have another outlet as a creator. The process is still the same as a designer. It's, it's the same thing, dude. I'm still listening to music. Oh, I like this music. Let me take it. Let me restructure it. Let me take this bass line. Let me take this drum. Let me take this harmonica sound. Let me add some, some let me rearrange it. And so it's just, it feels like it's the same process as a designer, just a different medium. And, you know, I feel like I get a lot of it's joy, man. That's really what it is in making a beat. So, you know, I was going to ask, like, does the music and your kind of design work, do they play into each other? But like you said, it, it kind of comes kind of from a similar place, it seems like. Yeah, yeah, it is. It's, it's the place where you take in all this information all the time. How do you release it? Right. And once again, healing, go back to the workouts in Umber. Umber was my way to heal something I, I had some challenges with. And in, a, in some ways, hopefully it helped other people heal as well, whatever challenges they're going through or trauma. And so same thing for making beats. I stuttered, right? So as a kid, I would not, like speaking for myself, fearing I would stutter. So I used to write raps too when I was a kid. I did open mic poetry where I lived in Chicago and Philly. Once again, hip hop, right? That became the tool for my creative expression. That mm-hmm. became the thing that gave me different outlets to do, right? So my love for type, is based on my love for for graffiti and and wild style lettering and tagging. That's what I was rooted from. It was all about the rhythm. Beat is the rhythm. It's the heartbeat. My speech therapist said this. My senior year in high school, she was like, when you talk, tap your feet. It may sound weird, but you're getting the words out. Talk in the rhythm. Mm-hmm. Right? For me, it's always about the rhythm. What is the rhythm of the beat? What is the rhythm of design? What is the rhythm of composition? What is the rhythm of space, of type? It's all about the rhythm, man. And so, and then the rhythm is really your DNA. The rhythm is the thing that you just, it's the thing you practice all the time, wherever it becomes a part of you. And so me making beats wherever is me just like finding joy in, in being a creative and not worried about getting paid for it. It's output, you know? So how do you define success now? Ooh, success for me is like, do I feel good in my body? Does my body feel good? Does my heart feel warm? Do I feel like I'm living my purpose? For me, that's success. Because that, that energy, currency, because energy is the currency. That's the real currency. So I just remember when I was doing the fundraiser for Umber, and it's like, when I'm low on money, there's a different way of asking. The way I ask for money is different. <laughs> when you have money and you ask for money, mm-hmm. different thing, dude. It's so different. And people can feel it. Success for me is working on the project, knowing I feel good in my body, accepting this project because I want to work on it, and I'm good. How do you be successful unconditionally? That's my goal, right? And so success for me, whatever, is feeling good in my body, knowing I'm living in my purpose, and being intentional around the kind of work that I want to do, and having the option with the choose the work that I want to work on, you know? That's for me, a success. I mean, that's really what it represents for me. Do you have a dream project now that you'd love to do one day? I mean, I know you put a lot into Umber and you've had that out in the world and you're sort of still mm-hmm. continuing and evolving with that mm-hmm. in a way. But what's something that you would just love to do if you had the opportunity? Oh, man. I would love to actually do a gallery, like an exhibit, like a whether it's at the High High Museum in Atlanta or Soma here, or even the Moad, the the Museum of African of uh, African Diaspora, but it's all like you say, it's not just art; it's print, it's music, it's a whole kind of experience. Where it could be even a conference, you know what I'm saying? But like the Dream Project is like this whole immersive experience where you get all of the senses is being engaged. 
through touch, through feel, through sound, through sight. And so um, that's the dream part. Almost like if somebody wants me to help them take their art and make this whole experience from now, or even my own art, but really it's like this immersive experience through like a, at a museum or a gallery. Everything is happening all at once. Everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> um, you know, it, the one thing too, like in Atlanta, the Funk Jazz Cafe, I don't know if they're still doing that, but I went to the first one in 97. Oh, I wow. Moved. You know what I'm saying? So that experience, oh my gosh, when you had people making art, you had people dancing, you had people doing open mic poetry, you know what I'm saying? You had food, you had vendors, you had art making, all happening in one space, right? And so that would be a dream project, to do this immersive experience at a gallery space where all the stenches being activated. When you look back, like, over your career and, and sort of where you're at now and what you've accomplished, like, what's the legacy that you want to leave onto the world? What do you want that to be? In a lot of ways, I am an archivist. Like, I keep things that, that are meaningful for me, I keep them, whether it's vinyl, where there's magazines, where there's cassette tapes, where there's photos. I would like to leave a legacy of being authentic with who I am that will ultimately encourage people to do the same. Like, keep that same energy and believe in what you're doing. And so, I don't know, I just want black and brown folks and definitely black folks wherever to see in another alternative than the what is promoted on media, on social media, or, or or TV or whatever, you know what I'm saying? Like, we need something else to look at. That's really what I want to leave. Like, a time capsule of like, oh, shit, we didn't just do this. We also did this, too. Like, why do we segment our art, Black people, in so many different, in so many other places where they all, if you go to family unit, everybody is there. You can have the nerd there, you can have the, the people, the person who just was a car spread, you can have the people who are, like, ultra religious you have somebody who's ultra like spiritual you can have everybody is at the table in the family right so why do we segment our art in spaces that don't need to be segmented why can we all just be in one space and so i want to archive our perspective in a way where you can see the hold both the dynamics dynamicism and the complexities of all that we bring Stop separating shit, man. Let's just put it all in one thing so we can feel like we belong with each other. You know, mm-hmm. that's, that's, that's what I want. I want for us to all feel like, yeah, I can, I can be here. And nobody's going to like judge me on what I like or what I don't like or what I'm wearing, what I'm doing. Like We all feel like that we have a space. So that's what I want to leave. The legacy of life and uh, uh, the archive, a time capsule of knowing that you were seen. Somebody out there hasn't had the same experience you had, you know, and you're not alone. Well, just to kind of wrap things up here, where can our audience find out more information about you, about your work and everything? Where can they find that online? So you can go to my website. This is MikeNichols.com. So Nichols is N-I-C-H-O-L-L-S.com. You can also go to ThisIsUmber.com. And social media is the same thing. This is Mike Nichols and this is on, on Instagram. So yeah, so all the stuff that you need to learn about me, what I'm doing is there. Oh, also to a life in hip hop.com, all one word, no spaces.com. All right. That is where I be. Sounds good, man. Mike Nichols, I swear this conversation has been a long time coming, but thank you <laughs> so, so much for coming on the show. I mean, I think as, as like one person to another, that's been helping to put out, positive things that black folks, particularly black creative people are doing out there in the culture for the culture. Like, like I said, during the interview, my hat goes off to you and I'm excited to see what is coming up for you around the corner. Like what's the next thing? What is Umber 3.0 going to look like? You know, (laughs) thank you so much for just being an inspiration for other media creators out there. I mean, this is not an easy road to walk, no matter, I think, what type of media you put out, whether that's print, video, audio, et cetera. When you do this kind of work, particularly, and you gear it towards people of color, particularly black people, it's just, it's a lot. And so I empathize with your story and, and the, the path that you've walked so much. So thank you for coming on the show, man. I really appreciate it. 
man, Maurice, thank you, man. Like this has been a pleasure and honor. I'm so glad this happened. This means uh, this means we have a good year. <laughs> the rest of this year is going to be <laughs> so good. So yeah, man, I, I appreciate it. I really, really, really do. Big, big thanks to Mike Nichols. And of course, thanks to you for listening. You can find out more about Mike and his work through the links in the show notes at revisionpath.com. Revision Path is supported by Brevity and Wit. Brevity and Wit is a strategy and design firm committed to designing a more inclusive and equitable world. They are always looking to expand their roster of freelance design consultants in the U.S., particularly brand strategists, copywriters, graphic designers, and web developers. If you know how to deliver excellent creative work reliably and enjoy the autonomy of a virtual-based freelance life with no non-competes, check them out at brevityandwit.com. Brevity and Wit. Creative excellence without the grind. Revision Path is supported by the School of Visual Arts, BFA Design, and BFA Advertising programs. SVA values originality and critical thinking while providing students an immersive learning experience with their faculty of industry experts. The BFA Design program empowers students with the tools and opportunities to shape the future of design. And the BFA Advertising program equips students with the skills in media and new tech needed to excel in the advertising industry. Learn more at sva.edu and enroll today to join one of the most influential artistic communities in the world. Revision Path is brought to you by Lunch. Our executive producer is Maurice Cherry and our editor and audio engineer is RJ Basilio. Intro voiceover is by Music Man Dre with intro and outro music by Yellow Speaker. If you like this episode, then follow us on Spotify, Amazon Music, YouTube, or you can leave us a rating and a review on Apple Podcasts. As always, thank you so much for listening and we'll see you next time.